Yo guys, hope you're good. Welcome back to another educational based episode with Mr. Joe Jeffrey. As you've probably seen before, we've done a couple of episodes. So today, I've got a couple of questions on here. We're going to be talking cycle stack design. I knew that was coming. Um, so we'll start off with, I presume, we'll kind of like keep it basic and then go forward from there. Mm -hmm. What would you say are kind of like a couple of Let's say, do you have any like rules or do's and don'ts with, with sort of cycle stack design? Um, From a competitive standpoint, obviously we're talking here. Rules, yeah, so th there's definitely like a list of compounds that I, that I wouldn't use, that I wouldn't be comfortable using myself or the client using. So a general good rule of thumb is to stick to only exposing yourself to compounds that are approved for human clinical use so you can have some form of predictable outcomes. Um, is number one and then I would set a sort of exposure limit as well potentially that would be a discussion with the client on what their level of risk to reward is what mm -hmm. they're in this for and we could set that maybe as like a milligram per kilogram mm -hmm. marker of talking purely anabolic steroids here because there's lots of like metabolic pathways of drug yeah. use don'ts would be like avoid ancillary drugs that bring you no benefit like <clears throat> aromatase inhibitors or selective estrogen receptor modulators or dopamine agonists like there's just no reason to use these if you do things properly in bodybuilding. This is definitely going to be one of my questions, again from consuming Joe's content. Obviously, I don't want to say you don't like the use of AIs, it's not really the term, but you know, obviously you don't tend to use um, AI. Well, essentially, if you have to use an AI, the issue is with your stack design. Mm -hmm. It's with the way that you're already taking your drugs. And using the AI as a solution that brings a myriad of problems and deleterious health outcomes that could be solved through means that don't carry those risks. So it would be mm -hmm. that simple, you know, these are drugs that are like categorically terrible for your health, <laughs> terrible for your physique potential, whether it be fat loss or muscle gain. You know, estrogen is a fabulous molecule with, with so many things that a bodybuilder wants and, and you could um, fix the issues without the mm -hmm. use of an AI. Sure, because I know you obviously spoke as well also about the potential use of them towards the end of a peak with regards mm -hmm. to drying out and stuff, mm -hmm. but obviously not for the use of, you know, combating, say, estrogen levels, etc. Yeah, even even in those circumstances, like, I don't want this to sound arrogant at all, but it's a, like, put this in perspective, like, <laughs> one of the things that I've got great sort of recognition for is bringing people into shows like really lean, mm -hmm. really hard, and very dry and I don't use AIs in any clients and I don't remove their testosterone or, or anything like this and we can have a detailed discussion on how that is but like essentially if you're in condition then estrogen is going to be your best friend. Sure, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense 100% so that's good that you like avoid those from like a health perspective that would be like the main idea for not using those. Uh, or, or, or a physique perspective yeah. either you know estrogen does a lot of really great things that bodybuilders should be interested in um very often times health is not a discussion with pro bodybuilders which is fine yeah um but understand that estrogen will increase your ability to grow it will increase your ability to mobilize fatty acids and mm -hmm. things like this um so i would just yeah uh, it, it's just a, a non-issue for me i think the only thing that people get their head up about estrogen is like holding water mm -hmm. in a prep um estrogen being one of many things that control fluid balance Aldosterone being a much bigger issue, um, that all androgens increase mm -hmm. aldosterone levels, but I would simply use something like an angiotensin receptor blocker to antagonize angiotensin, which is something that, um, sorry, to antagonize aldosterone, that, which is something that every enhanced bodybuilder should be using as a standard ancillary mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and then estrogen becomes like, okay, if we're talking about like partitioning fluid into cellular space, and if you have absolutely no fat cell space, which a bodybuilder shouldn't, then where are we going to be partitioning <coughs> fluid to, you know, intramuscularly, and that sounds great to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? 100%. So if somebody, for example, started to get estrogen-based side effects, mm -hmm. rather than just banging AIs, mm -hmm. how would you, what would you then do? Obviously, you bring certain things in, use different types, you'd obviously change the stack design approach, you'd realise they're out there, their peak of what they can take with regards yeah. to aromatizing. And if you say like estrogenic side effects, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't say that definition necessarily makes sense because hormone action in isolation <coughs> isn't, um, I don't want to say isn't important, but isn't like our primary consideration. Mm -hmm. 
um, you look at the androgen to estrogen ratio yeah, here, right? Yeah. If you have estrogenic side effects as a category, let's say you've got like some gynecomastia, then there would be an imbalance of androgen to estrogen action at the site of the nipple gland, mm -hmm. um, which is why these drugs uh, work well in you know um, breast cancer patients because you're modulating some of those like estrogen receptor beta um, agonist activity of these um, cancerous tumors and they would use something to selectively bind at the estrogen receptor there and block binding or or why masteron was used or testosterone originally was used in breast cancer patients yeah, as yeah. an androgen to to antagonize that activity at the <coughs> site um, so you yeah you would simply adjust your stack design to maybe uh, disfavor estrogen, so removal. Or, could, could you give an example of that? For example, what you would bring down and what you would. Yeah, so this, would you keep the total milligrams of the, of the cycle the same? You certainly can, yeah. So let's say an individual is using 500 milligrams per week of testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, you could adjust that to 300 milligrams per week of testosterone and 200 milligrams per week of masteron. Understand this, there's nothing magical about the androgen side of testosterone that's um, causing greater muscle gain. In humans, all anabolic steroids drive protein accretion to roughly the same amount per milligram. Mm -hmm. So your your anabolism at the androgen receptor is going to be the same whether it's from masteron or testosterone. Roughly the same, I should say, mm -hmm. to be precise. You are pulling down the estrogen, which um, will like reduce hypertrophy potential. But what's your option? Because you'd be doing that if you took an AI anyway. Yeah, yeah sure. You know, it's like why do that and have the sides from the AI if you yeah. can just change the cycles down exactly. itself. Exactly. So maybe you, 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 I say you preach, you use like the safe cycle, cycle stack design approach. Could you explain kind of what that is and how you, how you utilize that? Yeah, so I suppose if you're going to call your use safer use of... Yeah, safe, safer, shall we say. Yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. let's say no, anabolic is, uh, uh, gear usage is safe, but no, you, no. Know, you know what I mean? No, that's right, that's a good point. There's no yeah. safe use of super physiological yeah. amounts of any drugs. It's more but it, it would certainly be safer to modulate the stack design yeah. for the same total milligrams of, of total anabolic androgenic steroids as compared to using an AI, mm -hmm. and, and the outcome would, would be no different. You, your serum estrogen of 500 milligrams of testosterone with some arimidex may be exactly the same as your serum mm -hmm. estrogen of 300 milligrams of testosterone and the anabolism via the androgen binding at the androgen receptor again is going to be the same. The difference is the removal of the AI, mm -hmm. which is the which is a huge negative health concern. And that's also going to have a positive physical effect on the look of the physique as yeah, well. For sure. Down the line, sure. Um, we spoke about off camera the stuff you, we we mentioned about trend earlier. It'd be mm -hmm. quite good to get that um, on this video as well, like because you see a lot of people running sort of trend it pretty damn high doses and obviously mm -hmm. you know you use it at very low doses with your clients can you explain mm -hmm. like kind of why why that is and, and the reasoning behind that yeah so trembolone is a drug that has great utility and i think can be included as part of a safer stack design um the question becomes since we just mentioned that like all steroids do about the same thing when it comes to anabolism at the androgen receptor but why would we use something like trembolone it's because of its binding affinity to the glucocorticoid receptor. And to make this quick, it's, it's somewhat more complicated than this, but basically cortisol binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, and then you have an increased expression of muscle protein breakdown, mm -hmm. which of course we don't want. We can occupy the glucocorticoid <coughs> receptor with trembolone. You're gonna have reduced muscle protein breakdown. If you say all anabolic steroids are pushing muscle protein synthesis up, trembolone is pulling muscle protein breakdown down, you put those two together, you have a lovely permissive mm -hmm. relationship, right? That's gonna be doing more than more total milligrams of drugs that don't do that. So you understand with the addition of enough trembolone, you can use less total milligrams, mm -hmm. which is why this drug um, was uh, approved for human clinical use in, in the 90s for, for this reason. <clears throat> and trembolone is a steroidal psalm. So when we look at the Hirschberger assay, which is an assay um, that was used to define the anabolic androgenic ratio of steroids, mm -hmm. Trembolone being like five times more anabolic and five times more androgenic <coughs> in a rat. In humans, this has been shown to not be true at all. It's mm -hmm. far less androgenic than testosterone and about as anabolic. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that um, the dose required for these things is, is, is very low. And it was uh, originally prescribed at about 50 milligrams per week. Yeah. And I stick within the zone of what, what I would typically define as what will still be tissue selective. So up to one milligram <clears throat> per kilogram per week, Tremblone would have mm -hmm. efficacy for this goal. Any more than that, you're gonna have off 
target side effects and issues that could be um, avoided with filling those milligrams with other drugs. So say if you had a client come to you or someone come for consult, something like that, and they're, they're running, say, 100 milligrams per day instead of per week, for example, mm-hmm. what kind of side effects would they be uh, you know, going through that could be avoided and how would you then, you know, if it was up to you, how would you adjust their stack to keep them still using the same compound mm. but still be able to get a, you know, efficient results moving forward on a comp prep? Result? Right, so let's, um, if we have some further context on that, let's say this individual is like 100 kilo mm-hmm. and they're using 300 milligrams of testosterone with 700 milligrams of trembolone. Yeah. So we've got a 10 milligram per kilogram per week, so 1,000 milligram per week, <coughs> 10 milligram per kilogram per week of mm-hmm. androgen exposure in total. And, and they could have many issues uh, with this degree of trembolone exposure. You know, we, we know what these like overly <coughs> androgenic side effects or progestogenic side effects, trembolone being a synthetic progestin mm-hmm. of trembolone being potentially its neurotoxicity would be my greatest concern. Both trembolone and nandrolone have been indicated to have some concerning, not entirely elucidated in human clinical evidence yet neuro toxicity and we've also now defined that we don't need that amount of what trembolone's good at. I'd potentially say you could leave the testosterone of 300 milligrams, you could pull the trembolone to 100 milligrams and that leaves you with 600 milligrams left and you could fill that with another androgen that may suit your goals like um, if the individual is just after muscle protein synthesis, you know, protein accretion to either maintain skeletal muscle or build new skeletal muscle that I'd probably point them towards something like Mastron or, or Prima Bolan yeah. in that case. Sure. Or Anabar, you know, many of these other drugs that have been approved for humans <coughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. higher dosages. With a lot less side effects. Right, yeah. And sort of negative things that can go on. Obviously you mentioned Anavar there, I guess that moves us on to kind of the, the oral side of things. You see a lot of people, you know, uh, favorable towards the orals over injectables sometimes, especially with beginner cycles who potentially they shouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. What would your advice be with regards to oral steroids and dosages and things like that? I think when we look at any drug deployment, it's uh, looking at using the right tool for the mm-hmm. right job. So what is the goal? What are we really trying to achieve here? So coming back to that <coughs> example that we gave there, the individual's like, I want to grow muscle. Mm-hmm. Okay, so objectively your goal is protein accretion. Do you need an oral for that? No, but does it work for the end goal? Yes. Does the injectable work for the end goal just as well? Yes, so you've got the two options. Mm-hmm. Is one bringing more stress or deleterious health concerns than the other? <coughs> yes, the oral carries additional sure. health concerns via hepatic toxicity. So, so we just would not go. Yeah, yeah, so we just would not go with the oral in that case. And at what point then in a prep, for example, if we had someone who's competing, mm-hmm. at what point would you then utilize those those compounds with regards to orals because obviously you've got like say if someone's doing a 16 week prep mm-hmm. obviously you don't really potentially want to run that for that long mm-hmm. when would you look to put those in so at what point is the oral needed and there's many sort of deployments maybe you need the additional androgenicity it's what androgens do to things like glycogen synthase so pulling fluid intramuscularly cosmetically this is one of the things that androgens do to drive a cosmetic outcome you only really need that in the latter stages of prep right orals also have the benefit of a rather acute blood androgen spike you know being relatively short active life so maybe if we need that in the training window to support maintaining skeletal muscle on the way down that would be the deployment for androgens but other than that understand again in terms of their anabolism it's all doing the, about the same mm-hmm. thing the only thing that changes is that sort of acute blood androgen spike. Although there are nuances here specifically to things like maybe where you wouldn't want as much tissue selectivity. Like maybe you wouldn't want all the activity in skeletal muscle. Maybe you'd want some neurological activity, mm-hmm. i.e. aggression, yeah, yeah. you know, for training performance. So maybe that would be a deployment of when okay. I don't want something as tissue selective like Prima Bola. I, I need something that has neurological drive. Superdrol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Superdrol, <laughs> Winstrol, you know, yeah, um, yeah. things like that. Where, um, the past that in there for sure. Well, yeah. And then I guess finally onto kind of like fat burners and things like that, mm-hmm. you know, it's your himbine, kind of butyl, things like mm-hmm. that. When would you look to utilize them in it with the client? Again, so these, these carry a, um, although androgens do absolutely drive sympathetic tone within the autonomic nervous system, for anyone who doesn't know what that means, essentially like additional stress that needs to be managed because fatigue management is extremely important when it comes to prep. Sure. If you haven't got your fatigue managed well, you're not going to bring your best load. Yeah. Uh, th- these are more 
acutely focused on fatigue management because mm-hmm. understand that all of these things drive nervous system action pretty hard, especially things like your him being, <coughs> caffeine, clear neutral to a lesser extent, they all have a nervous system cost. So that has to be balanced within what your recovery capabilities mm-hmm. are and that comes to dose and duration of exposure. So <coughs> as needed, when you make an adjustment, you can make a caloric adjustment, you can make an expenditure adjustment, you can make a drug adjustment, way up where you can afford to take that yeah. adjustment from in terms of fatigue. Yeah, yeah. Where it's going to pull the, le- the least amount of fatigue from. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, 100%. And I guess it's known at what point throughout a prep you pull or add from you know, those decisions. Yeah, you have to assess the have. whole situation. Like, are you doing so much expenditure that that additional activity is going to drive more fatigue yeah. than an additional 20 micrograms of clenbuterol? Potentially. Mm. Are you right at the beginning of the prep and doing no expenditure? Do you know, yeah. An extra <laughs> thousand steps yeah, or a little yeah. bit of cardio is definitely not going to drive more fatigue than yeah. that clenbuterol, you know? Again, it just comes down to everything, you know, it's, it's, it's dependent on what stage you're at throughout the prep or where your physique's at to, right. to make those decisions. Yeah, right. But yeah, you know, um, I guess we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap things up there because we've kind of gone, gone into a good amount of detail. Uh, but again, like I said before, if you guys want even more detail, go and check out Joe on the Physique Collective website and on his Instagram and all, all that kind of stuff. If you've got anything else that you want to know, comment below and uh, we'll get back to you. Cheers, guys.